Hi, everyone. We'll give people a few more minutes to come in. Um, but in the meantime, I am very excited to be here um, with uh, Dr. Nicole N. Aljo, um, who will be presenting today on uh, the curious case of Chloe Russell's The Complete Fortune Teller and Dream. Um, we hope that you visit the fair at uh, abaa.org slash vbf for virtual book fair. If you haven't already, it runs until 7 p.m. tomorrow night Eastern time. Um, we are recording this session for later viewing. Um, and if you have any questions or comments during the presentation um, or as soon as uh, Dr. Aljo finishes up, we ask that you put them in the chat and we'll try to get to those um, at the end for the Q&A session. So now I'm going to introduce Nicole and Anjo. Aljo, Director of Africana Studies Program and Associate Professor of English and Africana Studies at Northeastern University. She holds a PhD in English Literature from Tufts, an MA in English Literature from the University of Vermont, and a BA in Art History from Vassar College. Uh, Dr. Aljo is the co-director of the Early Caribbean Digital Archive and director of Early Black Boston Digital Almanac, both associated with Northeastern's NU Lab for Text, Maps, and Networks, and the Snell's Library, uh, Snell Library's Digital Scholarship Group. So thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Aljo, and I will turn things over because you didn't come here to see me. Excellent. Um, thanks so much, Eloisa. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, Susan, um, uh, Benny as well for the invitation. Um, so happy to participate um, in the Boston Antiquarian uh, Book Festival. So, um, so welcome everyone. Uh, this talk is going to explore an intriguing text held in the Boston Athenaeum titled The Complete Fortune Teller and Dream Book. It purports to be written by Chloe Russell, a quote, woman of color of the state of Massachusetts, also commonly termed the old witch or black interpreter, end quote. Stated around the turn of the 19th century, uh, and the text is a puzzle for scholars. Russell is documented as owning a home in Boston's West End and was alternately listed as a washerwoman and cook. Um, and she's not now known to have written anything else. The text itself is this fascinating compilation of astrology, superstitions around choosing a mate, um, uh, and all of this is information that might have been reprinted from elsewhere. The, the talk today is going to share some of the unique aspects of this text um, uh, and facilitate some speculation about the author, um, the reason it was published, as well as its intended audience. I'm going to share my screen. Awesome. Um, so I, I learned about this text uh, from a colleague of mine, Eric Gardner, who is a, a literature professor at Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan. Eric wrote one of the only essays to fully analyze a version of this text in 2005. And most of what we know about the text is from that article, um, in which he also drew upon some of the research um, that had been done by Adelaide Cromwell, um, who is a, um, a sociologist who is at the University of Boston. Uh, I'm sorry, Boston University, um, and um, she was uh, researching a history of early Black Boston. I'm currently um, in the process of building on this research with students of mine uh, who are enrolled in my early African American literature class, um, because for a variety of reasons, Eric was not able to closely analyze the copy of the text that's in the Boston Athenaeum. And so my students and I are in the process of creating a scholarly digital edition of this text in order to share it more widely um, and more effectively with the public. Uh, in addition to transcribing and uploading a copy of this text, the students are also creating a variety of digital exhibits focused on aspects of the text, the author and its social and historical context. Our goal um, is to reveal the complexity of the seemingly simple text as well as to reveal just one of the many um, intriguing early black texts that are held in local archives and are accessible to Boston's community. In the archive, uh, in the 2005 article that appeared in the New England Quarterly, Gardner succinctly explains the stakes of this project. Quote, if Chloe Russell did author a fortune telling guide, then we have an exciting new addition to the small corpus of antebellum writings by black women. Even if she merely collaborated with the publisher, 
or her name was used without her knowledge, the work raises fascinating issues concerning the role of African Americans in the antebellum literary marketplace. Moreover, given the fact that Cromwell and Gardner have identified that there was a historical woman named Chloe Russell who lived in Boston during this time, it also raises the possibility that the text might offer meaningful commentary and engagement with representations of Black Boston in the mid 19th century. Okay, so um, just a tiny bit of background uh, about the text. Um, so the, the text that so we see here, um, so this is a, an the, um, the portrait of Chloe Russell. Um, and as you see, it calls her a woman of color of the state of Massachusetts, commonly termed the old witch or black interpreter, who certainly possesses extraordinary means of foretelling remarkable events. So here's the, the title page. Um, and uh, so it was published by a Boston based printer, Tom Hazard, um, it's the name you see here on the bottom. Um, and this, the, the, the text was likely printed between 1798 and 1827. Um, so we've identified this because this is the time period during which Tom Hazard um, was, um, um, was active here in Boston publishing. Gardner has identified four surviving copies of this text and none of them are exactly alike. Three of the texts are standalone copies. One is bound in a compilation. The oldest seems to be the copy that's held in Boston Athenaeum. Um, and uh, another standalone text is held by the Library Company of Philadelphia um, and a copy of the title page that you can see a copy of the title page of the one from Philadelphia right here on the on the left. Um, and uh, there's also another copy that was also, um, I'm sorry, uh, just lost my page. Um, the, yes, the, the, the standalone text is held in the Library Company of, of Philadelphia. Um, a partial copy um, of this text is also um, held in the American Antiquarian Society. And then another copy um, is, held by, um, um, is held by Gardner, um, is owned by Gardner. Um, each of the four copies, as I've said, is slightly different. The copy held by the Library Company includes an autobiography that is missing from the other copies um, and which Gardner transcribed for the article um, in which I've, I've I've um, given you, I've put it here on the slide. Um, that, copy, the co uh, that copy is also longer. Um, it also has additional features, um, such as um, a method for determining whether an absent friend is alive and healthy, a method for a young woman to find whether she will marry. Um, but overall, all of the texts are, they're pretty similar in structure and content um, to the scores of cheap chapbooks that were published in the 19th century um, that promise to help readers predict the future, um, interpret dreams, and attract a spouse. The Athenaeum copy has a total of 24 pages. Um, and like many of these cheaply produced texts, the cover is bare. Um, inside, uh, there is the usual author's portrait. But unusually in this case, um, the author has um, uh, uh, the author is a black woman, um, right? She's explicitly identified as a colored woman of Massachusetts. Um, and then, right, um, um, her. Um, her title is enhanced by right, the emphasis on one who certainly possesses extraordinary means of foretelling uh, remarkable events. As you can see from these images, uh, the text is incredibly well worn. Um, many, of the many of the pages are torn and the stitches in the binding is coming apart. There's also marginalia um, throughout the text, um, including some numbers. Um, uh, some of the numbers you see with you saw with at the uh, with the um, the illustration. There's a math calculation on the frontispiece somewhere. Um, there are also single, single letters on pages. And then there are some pinpricks um, throughout the document, which I'll, I'll um, say a little bit more about later. So the text begins here on the first page with a brief paragraph, which claims, quote, the knowledge of futur futurity has ever been considered as an object of peculiar advantage, end quote. And the claims um, that follows, it claims that what follows is going to be truth, quote, plain, clear, and full, end quote, rather than the fantasies of ancient times. And moreover, that, quote, we can with truth aver that in the course of a practice of 40 years, we have never known them to fail, end quote. So this text begins with this incredible assertion of Russell's authority and her infallibility, right? She's not been wrong over 40 years. It then launches immediately into directions to young ladies how to obtain the husband they most desire. And it gives you uh, incredibly detailed instructions about how to win a man's, infection, a man's affections or obtain a husband. It says um, young women must engage in this incredibly detailed process. Uh, it's incredibly complicated. It includes ascertaining his birth year, um, procuring appropriate flowers, 
um, in season fruits or dried rose leaves, um, and that you need to wear these, quote, touching your naked body. Um, after which um, one half of the item, so you split the, the, um, the, the, the flowers or the, the fruits or the roses in half, um, then one half of them are wrapped in the smallest package possible and then secretly passed to the young man while you continue to wear the other half for three days. The scented bundle is then placed in a trunk with your clothes and then, quote, very soon after, dressed in some of the clothes thus scented, you must contrive to stand or pass within six feet of the young man who from that moment, if he has worn or even smelt of the flowers that you sent him, contracts that love and regards for you which your presence will ever after rather tend to increase rather than diminish, end quote. So this is followed by a section on um, directions to young gentlemen on how they may obtain the wife they most admire. And whereas the directions for young ladies took up two full paragraphs, um, uh, two full pages rather, uh, the, the directions for young gentlemen only takes up a paragraph. Um, and it only requires them to use flowers soaked in water with musk and cinnamon oil, which doesn't seem so bad, um, right, as opposed to wearing the flowers for three days. Um, so the, this, the, the section, um, the next section, uh, which is the longest section, it's 10 pages, and these 10 pages focus on dream interpretation, uh, and it provides a list of images and details from dreams and their analysis. For example, um, one of the ones that I like in particular is um, its um, interpretation of dreams with apparitions. And it says, quote, the greatest and most important object of such dreams as ghosts, apparitions, specters, and such things is that they show the brain to be at that time in a state of derangement and the stomach is disordered. They show disappointment in courtship and that the person you love hates you, end quote. Um, so that seems like a pretty harsh dream. Uh, this is followed by a section of details on moles, uh, more of which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the next section focuses on, um, contains a fortune table. Um, this is this cool little um, uh, image here. And it's intended to, quote, resolve queries in matters of love and business, end quote. Um, and it looks as though the, the process here is to basically you ask a question um, and then you use pinpricks to try and figure out, devise um, an answer. Um, in a footnote, Gar Gardner explains that the rows correspond to the questions listed below. So the question here, what kind of a husband, a widow, or maid shall I have? And then you would use the pinpricks, the pinpricks in the in the table itself, um, and then the answer would be one of the the um, the numbered uh, sentences that that are underneath what kind of a husband. And then there, there are other ones ones throughout. Um, this section is a little confusing to me. I'm, I'm not real clear um, on how exactly this works, uh, but what I really find fascinating is that you can clearly see a multitude of pinpricks um, across this paper. They go all the way through on, and, and they're on the other, the, the subsequent two pages as well. The, the next section, and so these are, these are, you can see some of the other questions, you know, whether a maid shall have him she loves, how many husbands you expect, right? You can see the, the theme um, in terms of these questions, right? Whether it's best to marry or not, which I think is interesting, as well as queries about fortunate days. So the, the next section uh, focuses on astrology um, and it contains advice about men and women born at particular times. For example, um, the entry for March, which is the month um, when, when I was born, um, whoops, can't, there we go. Um, the, uh, the entry for March, um, the month when I was born reads, quote, about the 20th of March, the sun enters the first sign um, called Aries or Ram. A man born near this time will be of a meek disposition unless highly provoked. A woman born at this period will be sweet tempered, modest and chaste, end quote. And I'm sure that that is how I would be described um, by folks who know me. The text concludes with a final paragraph um, concerning a method by which a young lady may know whether she is ever to marry. Directions are offered to write the name of any man on a sheet of paper at the full moon supposed to fold the, the paper um, in the form of a heart. Then you dip that um, the folded up paper into a small glass of, of red wine. Then after you drink, then you must drink the entire glass before going to bed. Um, you put the paper under the pillow and then quote, let matrimony be your thoughts. 
And then if you dream that you're in the company of a young man whose person and conversation is pleasing, you may depend that you will become the companion of some agreeable person. And so rather than a summary um, conclusion, the narrative ends abruptly here. Uh, and I can't help but wonder about the rest of the fortune. What if you don't dream about anyone? Does that mean you won't get married? Um, and then what if the person is dis disagreeable? Does it, mean that you, that, does it mean that you'll get married, but you'll be unhappy? So the, and these last questions that I had at the conclusion made me think about the myriad other questions raised by the text. What kind of text is this? Is it similar or distinct from other texts published at the same time on topics of fortune telling and dream interpretation? And, and then of course, right, who was Chloe Russell? Why is she described as an old witch or the black interpreter? Why was this published? Who was the printer, Tom Hazard? And who was the intended or imagined, um, imagined audience? And so these are some of the questions that my students and I are in the process of trying to, um, trying to ascertain. Um, we don't quite know all of the, the answers yet. Um, and as I said, we're, we're still in the middle um, of, 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 figuring out, um, uh, of figuring out these, um, how to answer these questions. So let me start with um, what kind of text this is. So Gardner mentioned that this text was very similar to other texts um, about fortune telling that circulated and were incredibly popular during the 19th century um, when occult and fortune, fortune telling were popular experiences, right? Um, and so this was something, this was a, a form of not only entertainment, but it was also just something that a lot of people um, were, were very much into in the, in the 19th century, um, right? Mesmerism, um, right, these kinds of things. Um, and, so, um, and so these are, I'm showing you examples of other types of, of texts um, that would have been circulating at the same time um, that are also focused on this question of right fortune telling um, as well as dream book, right? You'll see that they have some of the, the same similar, similar titles. Um, the, the characterization of Russell as an, an old witch or black interpreter also seems to throw upon this uh, a popular trope at the time, which is the trope of the cunning person of color, um, the person of color kind of having, you know, um, alternative or occult knowledge in some way, shape or form. This is very similar to um, Tituba, uh, right, from the Salem witch, witch trials is another, um, right, um, uh, figure, this, this cunning person of color. Um, and so if the characterization of Russell was intended to be a trope, right, it could have been linked to a contemporaneous text like these or um, this text right here, um, which is the OB or the West Indian astrologers. Um, and so this text appeared in London in 1823 um, and is attributed to Ignatius Lewis, who was described as a Jamaican seer of color. Okay, um, and so if Russell is an invention or a beard for a white writer, um, right, they might've been working with this, with this particular trope. Um, the similarities amongst the fortune telling texts also speaks to and raising, raises intriguing questions about the circulation of 19th century uh, print culture. The rapid advances in print, te print technology, the cheapness of paper and thirst for entertainment by a reading public in the 19th century um, created a situation where reprinting of previously published texts was a common occurrence. And although rudimentary aspects of copyright law existed, it was incredibly difficult uh, to police. Gardner also notes that the Russell text shares a title with another text circulating at that time. Um, and this particular text went through four editions and was supposedly by Madame Connoisseur. Um, she's described, so here's the, um, I'm showing you the um, a copy of the frontispiece from the text here. She's described as, quote, first of the seven wise mistresses of Rome. Um, so again, right, it's referencing this individual as, um, um, right, um, as, as having right, additional knowledge, um, as well as being connected to, um, you know, uh, communities uh, of color in some way, shape, or form. And so here, in connecting her to the first of the seven wise mistresses of, of Rome, um, she's, uh, um, she's being connected to, um, right, what would have been called back then, right, gypsies um, or um, Roma, right. So the, and what's intriguing as well about um, this, this book that's attributed to Madame Connoisseur um, is the, the similarities in terms of the, the illustrations, right. The illustrations of the two female seers are presented in similar kinds of ways, um, each seeming to draw upon visual tropes of seers. 
Um, Russell is per portrayed as an old witch, right, with a scowl, um, right, a kind of very harsh look on her face. Um, and notice the moles on Madame Connoisseur's face. If we follow the advice about moles and in the book, um, we'll notice that all of the moles are on the left-hand side, right, which is the sinister side um, in the 19th century, right, left meaning sinister. Um, in the book, uh, it says that moles on either cheek means that an individual will never rise to fortune. Um, and it says in the book, if a mole is on the right forehead, that that means wealth and honor. And so here, the fact that the mole is on the left um, clearly means the opposite, um, right? So in all sorts of ways, right, she's being um, exoticized um, and um, debased. So while Madame Connoisseur is likely a pseudonym or a metaphorical name, right, Connoisseur, French to know, um, thanks to uh, uh, sociologist Adelaide Cromwell, we do know that there was an actual historical woman living in Boston whose name was Chloe Russell. Um, Cromwell identified Russell while writing a book on Boston's early black communities. And she identified her as one of six black women during the 19th century who owned property um, during the antebellum era in the West End of Boston. She used um, primarily census and tax records. Um, and from those, uh, we know that Russell is alter alternatively, alternate, uh, alternately listed her occupation as a laundress or a cook. Um, there were always other people who also lived at this address um, as noted in the, in the census and tax records. And so, uh, and we know that these were not family members. They were not identified as family members in the census and tax um, records. And so it's possible that Russell might have owned a rooming house um, and if so, it's likely that the tenants were also black. And consequently, um, it's for these reasons that um, we are thinking that the text might reflect um, aspects um, of um, th things that were important to Boston black, Boston's black community. As we know, right, many blacks um, lived on the north slope of Beacon Hill, as well as the south and west ends. Um, and um, in the 19th century, um, Boston was considered one of the most racially tolerant cities and had a significant number of black residents, as well as the high, one of the highest percentages of black literacy. Um, and so uh, I'm showing you here um, a, um, the, the map from Adelaide uh, Cromwell's book on the black presence in the West End of Boston, 1800 to 1864. Um, and she basically hand drew this map um, of, uh, of Black Beacon Hill. Um, and you can see here, um, this is where uh, Chloe Russell's house would have been. Um, Chloe Russell owned a house at 8 Belknap Street. Um, so it would have been um, right in here. Um, and you'll see here that the African-American meeting house, right, is right here as well um, it's in, at Smith Court. And then the triangles and dots all um, identify houses that were either owned um, or in which Black folks lived. So you can see, right, that this is um, a pretty vibrant um, uh, uh, Black community. So my students and I are exploring the possibilities of what this text um, might be conveying about 19th century Black Boston culture. Um, first and foremost, it offers a compelling narrative and authoritative voice, um, and that voice is said to reside in a Black body. Though stereotyped and exoticized, Russell is nevertheless portrayed as a powerful figure who knows all and in 40 years has never been wrong. In one of the other copies of the text, there's an autobiography, um, and it claims that Russell was born in Sierra Leone. She was kidnapped, enslaved in Virginia, and then gained her freedom because of occult knowledge and eventually made her way north. The biography draws on several tropes common to early slave narratives, um, and when describing the location of her village, she places it in a location that would have been several hundred miles out to sea. She also um, misnames the um, uh, several areas um, that she's you know, describing, um, you know, supposedly providing evidence of. Um, so consequently, Gardner suggests that the autobiography is likely a fabrication. However, here again, um, the construction of a putatively African background offers an intriguing method of authorization that paints her African knowledge as desirable and valuable. The biography suggests that she learned witchcraft in Sierra Leone and brought that knowledge with her to the, to the United States. And so consequently, a couple of my students are exploring the history of witchcraft and its representations in Western Africa, specifically um, Sierra Leone, um, to see whether this might help us to understand maybe some of the, um, um, maybe some of the, the details that she's describing, um, or um, it might help us to understand more um, about the diversity of the, of the community, of the Black community here um, in, in Boston at that, at that time. 
This is going to be complemented by research by another set of students um, that are, are going to focus on witchcraft in Massachusetts, um, with particular attention, of course, to the Salem witch trials um, and to representations of, uh, of Tich Tichuba. Although the text does reference witchcraft, unlike the other copies, um, the, the, the copy that's in the Boston Athenaeum, right, which is the copy that Eric wasn't able to see, which is why we are going to be creating the digital, um, the, the scholarly digital edition, there's no um, information about palmistry um, or some of the other uh, superstitions that are in the longer, the longer texts um, that, are, that are held elsewhere. Um, much of the information in this, um, in this in the text, the text that's held in the Boston Athenaeum seems focused on marriage um, and st the stability of wealth. And so consequently, I think it might um, speak to the desire within the African-American community in Boston to marry um, and create homes in the city. Most uh, my students often comment that Russell's text with its emphasis on how to catch a mate, um, right, astrology, it seems a lot like um, women's magazines like Cosmopolitan and um, Mademoiselle or the um, older variations, older iterations of those magazines. So maybe um, one of the ways that we can think about this text, at, text is as a kind of conduct manual um, and possibly an early manifestation of the politics of respectability uh, that Maria Stewart argued for um, uh, and, and that we also see uh, manifest in the photos um, from the Hayden album, um, which are here, um, also held um, at the Boston Athenaeum. Um, as students learning in Boston, um, students uh, are often focused on Boston writers like um, Louisa May Alcott, Poe, etc. cetera, um, but there are numerous Black Bostons left written records um, of their experiences. They offer compelling stories about the efforts to physically and metaphorically claim space in Boston. There are also many other similar texts in the archive that need recuperation and could use this type of work. By creating a digital scholarly edition, my students are participating directly in the production of knowledge. This project is encouraging students to connect their engagement with social equity and justice movements to their analysis of 18th and 19th century Black texts. Given our current context, it also contributes to the creation of accessible educational materials that can help diversify teaching materials and narratives about antebellum Black lives. Thank you. I'm going to end there. Um, and so at this point, we can open it up for questions. I will stop sharing my screen. Yes, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and or the question uh, box. We have one question so far. Um, could the uh, Athenaeum's copy be missing pages? Could it be missing pages? It doesn't look that way. Um, so the the um, even though the um, the the way that it's bound, um, it doesn't look as though there are any missing pages because it's right. It's the the full sheet of paper that's that's folded in half. Um, and so if there were missing pages, right, um, there'd be either right these loose sheets, and there aren't any. Um, so it looks like if it is a reprint, um, right, that maybe they only reprinted these sections. Um, but I, I will say that the, the sections don't, the organization of the text does not match exactly in, in all of the, the different copies. Um, so it's not as though they just like copied a part of it, um, right? Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's just the oddest thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have another question. What might we learn by comparing all four versions of the text together, if possible? Right. Um, so I think one of the things that we can learn is we can learn a lot about um, the circulation of print culture. Um, right. Uh, so we have some ideas about the way 19th century print culture circulated. Um, and, and this text confirms some of those ideas. It also challenges others of those ideas. Um, so, so the, I mean, so the, the um, the, the thing that stands out for me through most in terms of, of challenging um, is this question of the authorship, right? Um, and that it, it, you know, we have a black woman who's the center who is presented as an authority on this particular knowledge, right? Um, so there's that. Um, but um, it also um, speaks to this culture of reprinting, um, which a colleague of mine of Northeastern, um, uh, Ryan Cordell, has also explored pretty extensively. Um, so the ways in which um, text would circulate, um, first of all, they circulated, you know, by hand, by people, you know, walking around. They also circulated um, on um, via the railroad, um, right? Um, and, you know, again, if just to, to, to emphasize, 
the, there's, there's these advances in print culture, right? So, so printing, the, the technology of printing um, is now uh, much faster as well as more accessible, as well as cheaper, right? Paper is also cheaper. Um, and, uh, and so, um, and then, you know, there's also the fact that people have a little more, you know, leisure time. Um, and then there's this question of, of reading, right? As, as entertainment. Uh, and so these, these, these texts, we can look at them as, right? publishers wanted to publish something, um, right? And so, you know, these were texts that were popular, um, as you saw from the, from the examples that I showed you. Um, and there are many other uh, iterations um, of these and versions of these. Um, they also show up in other languages. So this is a global um, entity. Um, so they are in, in French um, as well. Um, uh, but um, uh, yeah, it really um, complexifies our understanding of print culture in the 19th century. Um, and it also suggests that our ideas about ownership of particular texts, right? So this idea that um, a particular author owns a text, right? This idea is, these ideas that um, are, um, you know, in concert with notions of, you know, plagiarism and things like that, um, it's, it's much more complicated, right? Um, that it's not just a question of, oh, um, you know, whoever created this text is plagiarizing, right, something that was originally written by, by, by someone else. Um, I think that's not often the, um, a, a useful way to, to look at it. Um, what's, what's I, what I find fascinating is to think about why were these texts you know, circulating, um, you know, what is it that's going on in society that, um, you know, makes people so anxious, um, right, that they want to and need to, um, you know, read these um, things and, and, and apply for, um, seek out alternative knowledge. Yeah. Um, is the text aimed at one particular gender? Um, because you brought up uh, Cosmopolitan Mademoiselle magazines, right, but they also right. have that paragraph for men. Yeah, so yeah. That for, like moms to tell their sons, or right, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So no, it it seems to it seems to be both. You know, so there are directions. You know, for young men as well. Um, but there does seem to be an emphasis on women, um, right? Um, and that would stand to reason, right? Where where women had much more to right, either gain or lose by the institution of of marriage, right? Um, it um, at least in the nineteenth century, right? It was there. Um, it was much more important, um, right, for them to be um, associated um, with. Um, um, or to get married, basically, um, in order to be a quote unquote good woman, um, right, according to the, the folks in society. So one of the, the attendees asked, uh, the portrait on the book's illustration has red ink. Does that present a, uh, does that represent a prestige publication, um, a quasi-religious text like Bibles? Uh, so that use of the red on the cover. Yes, the use of yes, the use of the red is very interesting. Um, I'm uh, and and this is why I'm I'm super excited about my students doing the research in terms of Africa, um, and witchcraft in Sierra Leone. Um, I know that in a lot of West African spiritualities, color, um, particular colors are very important, right? They signify in particular kinds of ways. So it would be interesting to see if there is any kind of connection, um, you know, between the color red um, and maybe some of the spiritualities um, where she's purported, right, to have been from. Right, remember, right there some right ambiguity about whether she's actually right from Sierra Leone um, but um, nonetheless the idea um, right that they are representing her um, as um, offering you know facilitating African knowledge in particular kinds of ways I think um, I think is interesting um, and important to to attend to and I think the color um, might 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 connect that I'm not sure if it'd be connected to the Bible just in light of the fact that this is an occult text, right? Um, so it's about alternative knowledge, you know, not knowledge that would have been sanctified, sanct, uh, sanctified by the Bible. Um, but um, the, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the color is interesting. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the text. Um, and um, I, I have not, obviously because of COVID, um, been able to, to see the other, the other copies in the Athenaeum. I'm sorry, in the, um, the American Antiquarian Society um, or at the, at the Philadelphia Library Company. Um, but I do hope um, to go see them um, at some point um, to ascertain whether there, there, there is color in these other examples. Wonderful. Uh, do you know how the texts came into the collections? Were they saved by design or chance? That I don't know. Um, that I don't, I don't, I don't know. Is it known where or how the Athenaeum acquired their copy? No, although I think 
someone from the Athenaeum might be in the audience. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if they would know offhand, um, but um, yeah, if that's some, another. Put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can throw it in the chat. Uh, um, but I think, as, I think, as I, I recall, for, I, I think it was donated. Yes, yeah, it was a gift. Okay. Gift. Um, yeah, 1988. <laughs> Thank you. What a cool gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shout out to John Tracy Wigan. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> Could you share your thoughts or any questions on whether or not this actually qualifies as a book? based on the physical components of the text. For example, the binding edges, hand coloring, might it be considered an artist book? An artist book. Hmm. Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's an artist book because of the, the very pragmatic aspect to it, right? And that it's, you know, it's basically a self-help text. Um, right, um, a text, and and then the just the the use, and it feels as though it looks like um, when I you know when I did, was able to look at it, it does seem like it's a a text that someone was looking at and using over and over again. There are little stains throughout it, um, as I said, the pinpricks right from folks who've who've done the um, done the um, uh, the fortune table, um, uh, you know, little little exercise, um, and so and so I think it I think it was definitely something that somebody was using um, and um, and touching um, you know on a, on a regular basis so so, so in that it doesn't feel like it was it was an artist book which feels like there isn't that kind of um, uh, that kind of um, you know textuality to it um, that kind of engagement with it um, but but it, but it could be right um, this could it could be a, um, a complete fabrication right um, but right, what complicates it is the historical documentation of an actual Chloe Russell, right, living in Boston at the time um, that the that that the book was was complicated, um, and so I think another you know question um, I'm not sure someone is going to ask is you know whether Russell was involved um, in the in the publication, right, um, and that we have absolutely no idea um, other than that she was alive at the same time, um, you know, um, and so we definitely will be needing to do some additional research, but. Um, it would be really interesting to think about, um, you know, this woman basically allowing her image um, to be used, um, right, in, in, in this particular kind of way. Um, I wonder if, you know, she, maybe um, she had a financial arrangement with Hazard, um, you know, where, you know, maybe she's kind of like a kind of like a ghost writer in a way, um, you know, and maybe she was you know, paid for her um, experience or something like that. Um, I think, I mean, it just raises so many, I mean, this is why this 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 text is just so fascinating, um, right, is that it just raises so many questions about authorship and about power and about writing, right, and about identity, um, right? Did she know she was going to be, you know, referenced old witch <laughs> black interpreter, um, right? Um, I mean, maybe those terms. I mean, they, they, those terms seems kind of awful to us now in the 21st century. Um, but maybe in the in the 19th century, um, you know, they were. It was. It was. Um, these are honorific terms. You know, maybe in some way, shape, or form. I, I, I don't know. But it, it is a really intriguing question that I that um, we're we're planning to explore. Yeah, and I think what complicates all of that for me is the fact that she owned property. Yeah. Right. And that right. it may have been like a boarding house. And right. so who was coming in and out? Right, right, right. You know? and, yeah. yeah. And so and so that's what that's what makes me think that it might have been a kind of conduct manual, um, because if you think about it. Right. So this is Boston. Right. Late 18th, early 19th century. Right. This is um, right. Post Revolutionary War. Right. Maybe on the, the cusp of. Um, you know, um, the War of 1812, but there's all of this movement right here in Boston, right? Um, folks coming up, right, as well as um, escaped slaves, right, as in, enslaved people, right, who are, are coming to Boston as well. And so if you think about it, if you're in this urban environment um, where there are lots of different people and you don't necessarily know these people, you're trying to find a husband or a wife, you know, you're going to take whatever advice that you can, right, to ensure that this individual, you know, is actually going to, um, you know, turn out to be a good individual that you can, you know, have uh, a life with, because as, as we know, right, life in the 19th century, um, you know, um, very, very difficult um, in particular kinds of ways. I'm going to do the very selfish panelist thing and ask my own question. Uh, so was <laughs> the, do you believe the intended audience of the book was other women of color and specifically black women, or was it a text written for all women? 
So I, I don't know, but um, given given that um, Russell is living like right in the center of Black Beacon Hill, right, um, that there's so many people around her, if she is, you know, um, running a, um, a boarding house, you know, it makes sense um, that she would also, you know, you know, have this, um, um, you know, tool um, that, um, that 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 folks that folks could use. Um, but then on the other hand, right, um, also, if there is this, um, uh, you know, this desire for reading texts that are authentically occult, right, because they are written by, you know, a Black person or a person of color um, in some way, shape, or form, then, you know, that itself, right, speaks to, right, this desire of this white audience, right, to see, I mean, we have the, maybe the first instance of the quote-unquote magic Negro trope, um, you know, um, that shows up in, in um, a lot of, uh, uh, films and such. So I think I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, what have you learned so far about the publisher? Um, so the publisher, so, th so that's a question. So the, um, there is definitely, you know, Tom Hazard was definitely a, a publisher here in Boston. Um, he regularly published, um, you know, compilations um, and reprinting, things like that. And so we're thinking that maybe this, this might be why it might not necessarily be a text by, right, a, a Black woman. It might be, you know, solely like this marketing kind of, kind of, kind of effort. Um, but really he was, um, we, we don't know a heck of a lot um, about Dom Hazard, same um, with, with Chloe Russell, other than that he was a, um, a he published popular texts at this time. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. And do you know where the physical copy, um, the Athenaeum has text source from before it ended up in the archive? I'm sorry, ask that one more time. Where was the physical copy of the Athenaeum text sourced from before it ended up in the archive? Where was the physical copy? Um, it looks like the copy in the, the Boston Athenaeum was a gift. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like it's a gift from John Tracy Wigan um, in 1988. I don't know, I don't know anything about um, Wigan, um, you know, who he was or anything like that um, at this time. Um, certainly that is, you know, one of the things that um, a student, the students um, will will explore. Have you or your students looked at connections to the increase in interest in astrology and tarot in our current culture? So I think that's one of the things that we would like to do, right? To think about what this, how this text um, might create the foundations for, you know, interest um, and engagement in a cult, just generally speaking, right? That is characteristics of our, our society in particular, right? And this desire, this desire to know more, um, right? Um, than, um, you know, than, um, um, you know, then, then you have access to, right, um, to find, you know, find out additional knowledge, right, um, in some way, shape, or form, because that's going to give you an edge, um, you know, um, in life um, somehow. Uh, I just had like a flashback to getting Seventeen magazine and opening yes. to the back to read my horoscope. Uh, exactly. Great and terrifying. Yes. Uh, is it possible exactly. the print the pinpricks might be related to a form of geomancy, as in Ifa or Napoleon's Book of Fate? I don't know, um, but that is a really great suggestion. Thank you. Whoever suggested that. Shout out to Andrew. Okay. For that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, which will be, I guess, maybe part of the research now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. This, was this published around the time of the Fox Sisters? The Fox Sisters. I don't think I know the Fox Sisters. Okay. If you could tell me in the chat what that is. I can let you know and when that is. Cool. We don't have any more questions unless someone wants to throw one in the chat or add one to the Q&A uh, little box at the bottom. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything that we didn't get to? Oh, the Fox sisters are spiritualists much oh, right. later than this publication. Okay. okay. So yeah. So they're um, well toward the tail end of this. Yes. Um, so if this is if this is um, thank you. Um, if if this is published, um, you know, um, later on. Um, so we're thinking that it's between 1798 um, and I think 1847, 1837. I have to go back to look at the numbers. 
1827. Um, so that's, but that's when that's when Hazard um, was um, was active. But it is possible that it might have been printed later, um, and right, someone would just have used right um, Tom Hazard's name um, to right to, to to circulate this text because he would have known about it. Awesome. Any closing remarks? Anything you'd like to add from closing remarks? Um, well, I mean, this is it's such an incredibly cool text, and it's just one example of several um, texts um, that are in local archives. Um, early black texts um, that are in in local archives. Um, some of these doc some of these texts are already digitized and are accessible. Um, but um, I think it really is important for us to have more eyes um, on these texts, more analysis of these texts. They're traditionally just interpreted. Um, in terms of as as reflections of you know black identity um, or right we we check the, we check the box that this is the first iteration of this thing right the first iteration of that thing um, and not really thinking about the ways in which these texts are in conversation with other types of texts right um, as well as the aesthetics of these texts right so thinking about right the the, the images that are in um, in, in the Chloe Russell text, so not only the illustration of Russell, um, but there's that image of um, right that the fortune book, um, as well as that the image on the frontispiece of kind of like that right the Leonardo man right um, with uh, right little astrological features and images and those kinds of things. Um, so so really yeah, um, just um, there are there are so many of these texts um, and. Um, we really could use some extra eyes on them to analyze them as well as to share them, you know, with folks. I mean, our goal is that, you know, maybe folks, um, teachers in Boston Public Schools, you know, can can use um, these um, these things that we are digitizing and making more public um, so that, you know, young people can see that, you know, that there were a variety of, of ways of living um, in the 19th century um, and that it's not just, right, these stale stories that we keep being told over and over again. Um, Right, so um, that would be it. Awesome, okay. Oh, okay, someone just popped in a question. So we'll get okay. to this since we still have time. All right. uh, Eric says, I was just thinking about the connection with spiritualism, i.e. the Fox sisters. Spiritualism has been connected to a feminist movement, but not really one that includes black women. Might that be a reaction to the success of texts like this? I think so. Um, you know, I do. I do wonder if there's a way in which um, there might be another story that could be told about um, uh, about spiritualism, um, particularly here in Boston. Um, you know, um, I, I wonder. Um, you know, if there is right the the, the traditional story that we want to tell ourselves are around Black spiritual practice in the 19th century is that it is right overwhelmingly Christian, right moral, virtuous in particular kinds of ways. Um, and so what we see here with Russell um, is maybe there is actually this transatlantic African influence. Um, you know, on um, uh, Black American culture that extends longer, right, than and and far beyond um, the um, the turn of the century, right, ending of the of the slave trade, um, that maybe some of these African retentions um, are were held onto like longer um, into 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 the 19th century. I think that I think that would be um, you know really great, especially in light of um, uh, I, I don't think they're proposed, but right, but um, research that folks have been doing around. Um, the black community that was in the North End, um, right? So the, um, I can't remember what that area was called. I think maybe it might've been called New Guinea or something like that, right? And I, I think part of the reason why it was called New Guinea is because there were so many African descended, um, right? Directly from Africa, um, blacks who were living um, in that area. And so it would be interesting to see if there are um, actual connections between, right? New Guinea, because we know in that area um, that people from, that was a very, uh, one of the, the first locations where Blacks were living in Boston and that they eventually moved across the city into Black Beacon Hill and then the South End and those kinds of areas. Um, so maybe this, you know, allows us to see some of that movement um, um, as well. Um, but also I think, you know, importantly, it offers um, a um, evidence of, you know, the Black community in Boston and its dynamism, right? It's diversity, um, you know, um, and, um, and yeah, it's, uh, you know, deep structures here. Absolutely. Yeah. Amber said in the chat, I hope you'll eventually publish a book on your research. And I think <laughs> all of us here hope that that eventually happens uh, because this has been so, so fascinating. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And we have a question in the chat now. Have you studied black conjuring in New Orleans? And so I have. Yeah. So I I, I have. Um, and so the the problem for me is location, right? Um, and trying to figure out, you know, how um, because there's a lot more um, articulation and descriptions of say black occult in the southern United States. Um, so in you know around New Orleans as well as um, around St. Augustine in Florida. Um, and so and so for me the difficulty is trying to make that leap right from so how how would that knowledge have gotten there so but I you know we haven't um, finished that research but we're hoping to but yes um, I we are thinking about this this question of, of um, connecting it to the black conjuring um, in New Orleans. Wonderful thank you so much for for joining thank you. us. Um, I hope everyone checks out the virtual book fair abaa.org slash vbf virtual book fair. Um, yes open till 7 p.m. tomorrow night, Eastern time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Great, thank you.